Becca Royfe is here. She's a former assistant district attorney for New York County, and you were with us all yesterday watching this testimony. You've yes. been with us a lot, actually. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about this uh, possibility of um, the attorney general being held in contempt of Congress if he doesn't show up, if he doesn't, if he doesn't hand in the unredacted version of the Mueller report. What does that mean? Um, contempt of Congress is, you know, it's like contempt of court. It's it, uh, Congress has subpoena power. They have powers to compel and individuals, even if their administration officials are required to comply. And if they don't comply, then Congress can call them in contempt. What's more complicated is how to enforce that because um, our enforcement mechanisms, are, of course, are not in the legislative branch. Our enforcement mechanisms are in the executive branch. So Congress has a hard time compelling the executive branch to enforce its orders. So the statutory mechanism is that you refer, if, you, if somebody is held in contempt of Congress, you refer that to the United States Attorney's Office. But of course, the United States Attorney's Office reports to Bill Barr. And um, usually, I mean, in the past, it, they can, there's some ambiguity in the statute, so maybe it could be litigated, but it's been interpreted such that the prosecutors or the U.S. Attorney has some discretion. Mm. So once that referral comes to them, they don't have to actually prosecute bar for contempt of Congress. It's just a refer so treated like a referral. So, so does that mean that Congress may never see the unredacted version unless William Barr wants them to? Yes. I mean, unless there's some, uh, you know, unless they can find some other, you know, mechanism to do it or some w means of judicial enforcement, because mm -hmm. it seems like the ability for them to just enforce their their contempt citation yeah. is, is, it's limited. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So we were talking about this earlier before you came on set about the question that Senator Kamala Harris posed to William Barr. Uh, he said, in response to a question from her, that he had not looked at the underlying evidence from the investigation when he decided not to charge President Trump with obstruction of justice. Um, he only relied on the information in the report. I thought that was one of the moments, uh, the exchange that he had with Senator Harris was one of the few moments that he actually appeared flustered. We saw Nancy's package when he was asked specifically about investigating anybody else. He parsed the word, suggest, I'm grappling with suggest, as opposed to, I mean, what did you make of that, that he hadn't looked at the underlying evidence? Yeah, I mean, you know, the way that prosecutors' offices work is that, um, you know, of course there's a hierarchy, of course there is reporting, but there's a lot of deference to the, what's called the line prosecutor. That's the person who's been most in contact with the evidence. And so normally what happens is a supervisor will have a conversation with that person. They may not look at all of the underlying evidence, but they usually defer because the person who does the interviews and so forth has, is in a better position to assess the, that evidence. So if you're going to make a charging decision without that person, in this case Mueller and his team, um, you would think that you would want to look at some of that underlying evidence at least and assess it for yourself. I think the implication here in that line of questioning was that Barr had made up his mind. And, um, you know, the American public, I think, is rightfully concerned about that, especially given the fact that he wrote this memo before he got the job telling sent, and sent it to the White House, which is a little bit weird, right. mm -hmm. um, saying that he, you know, his view of obstruction of justice and that um, the president, at least in certain circumstances, can't obstruct justice. So I think once he's come out saying that, and then there's this implication that, you know, he didn't review all of this evidence and that he came up with this charging decision very quickly after receiving the report, of course, in consultation with Rod Rosenstein, who'd been involved in a more ongoing way, but still, um, that, that should give us pause and make us wonder whether he truly is acting as an independent law enforcement officer or in some way has sort of made up his mind before he took this job. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to go to some sound uh, that was another sort of uh, a spark moment, right? Uh, Senator uh, Maisie Hirano said that the attorney general lied about his conversations with Robert Mueller after he put out a summary of the report's conclusions. That was the big news yesterday that came out before the hearing. I want to play a little bit of that sound. You lied to Congress. You told Representative Charlie Crist that you didn't know what objections Mueller's team might have to your March 24th so-called summary. You told Senator Chris Van Hollen that you didn't know if Bob Mueller supported your conclusions, but you knew you lied, and now we know. So what do you make of that questioning? Do you think that she successfully sort of called his judge, sort of questioned his judgment? And his credibility. Yeah. His credibility. I mean, yeah, more you than know, judgment. 
it, it, lie is an interesting, you know, lie is like one of those words that it depends on how you're using it. Right. So if you're using it in the, you know, strict legal term, did he commit perjury? I don't think so, because I think he has a way out. I think he can say, you know, I interpret it in a different way, which he, he does. You know, he said, I didn't know that, that you were referring to Mueller. I thought you were referring to other people, the mm -hmm. other people who were in those news reports. I didn't know who they were. I mean, all of that gets him out of a perjury charge. Mm -hmm. But um, how successfully does it get him out of the underlying suggestion that he was not honest with Congress? I don't think it does. Yeah. And, you know, it's like sometimes we get caught up in these legal questions and we forgot to look at, well, what's the broader question here? The broader question here is this is the Attorney General of the United States. The Congress, a co-equal branch, was trying to get some information from him. He could very easily know what they were trying to figure out, and he withheld it from them. Right. And that seems inappropriate to me, whether well, you want to call it lying or, you know, as she did, or you want to call it something else. It, it, it's, it's troublesome, I think. So Senator Richard Blumenthal also asked the Attorney General if he kept any notes from his phone call with Robert Mueller. I want to play a bit of that exchange. Did anyone, either you or anyone on your staff, memorialize your conversation with Robert Mueller? Yes. Who did that? Uh, there were notes taken of, of the call. May we have those notes? No. Why not? Why should you have them? Uh, so the, I mean, again, that kind of belligerence from the Attorney General to a member of Congress, a member of the Senate, asking for information in the role, the constitutional role that the Senate has as advice and consent. Um, what did you make of that? That he, I, I guess the bottom line, Rebecca, is we really need to hear from Mueller. Yeah, I mean, that's the bottom line. Right. You know? I mean, I'm like, we're sitting here going, like, what does he mean? True. What's he trying to say? We right. need to hear from Robert we, Mueller. We need to hear from Robert Mueller. And, you know, there's there, there are two issues going on here. You know, one is, what Bill Barr did and who he is in this role and whether he's serving this role. And the other one is the underlying investigation. So, you know, taking a step back, I just, you know, I think that actually our institutions have worked pretty well on the latter. Like in terms of, you know, we had this investigation. I think most Americans have confidence in it, despite the repeated attacks on Robert Mueller and his team. The report has come out. Of course, it's redacted, but it's not terribly redacted. And in that way, things have worked pretty well. Um, you know, there's the this glitch right now that's frustrating and it's upsetting and it's and, and it is concerning but I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we also there's there's one piece of things that's working very well and is continuing to work well here it, it, it also though when you read the report and you see the Attorney General appearing before members of the Senate there and you re you realize that Don McGahn even though he was part of the administration he's one of those individuals who when we, we talk about the institutions are only being uh, only being as strong as the people who are enforcing them mm -hmm. Dom again saved the president from possibly a worse outcome than he's experiencing right now. And he didn't have to. He could have just gone along with it, as James Comey wrote in his op ed, that there are a lot of people who've just gone along with it by their silence. Mm -hmm. They've implied their complicity. By refusing to fire Mueller. Mm -hmm. should exactly. remind people. Yeah. yeah. We're Rebecca, gonna be talking to you, thank you a little bit more. Rebecca, thank you.